here. Start do like this to your hair in the back. You ain't got it. Just still up. There we go. No, go this way. In the kitchen. All right, ladies, in the kitchen, can you come in, please? I'm listening to Nia there. Nia, be nice. What do you want, lady? Are they almost coming? Amy, can you tell them to come now? So next month, our date is Friday, November 12th, and that's our last Girlfriends of the Year because we take December off, and so I don't have a topic yet or what we're going to do, but keep looking out and plan to be here, so we'll do something great, have a, have a good holiday something. I'm sure Shiloh has some ideas already. <laughs> All right, so are you ready for the word? Yes. All right, so Amy, you want to do your song or first? Okay, stand up so you can shake off some of this great soup we had. Amen. You're going to go forth and interpret. I yield myself completely to you. This is all of you. This is none of Amy. And I thank you for the presence of God that rests heavy in this place. I thank you for the spirit of God that rests heavy in this place. Satan, I bind you and I command you to be quiet in the name of Jesus. You have no right here, you have no authority here, and you cannot speak. Go. I thank you that the minds and the hearts of these women is open, ready, and receptive to your word going forth tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hmm. I'm excited to be with you guys tonight. So it was funny, I actually, um, last year I taught in October on receiving. And um, I was like, wow, that was already a year ago. Doesn't it feel like time goes really fast lately? It feels like that was like two months ago. And I was like, man, that's wild. And the Lord talked to me about um, you know, a topic. And it was kind of just depositing things in my heart all this week, and it was a really kind of a crazy week with me at work. I do, um, I do a lot of public speaking with my job, many of you know that, and so I am usually like, you know, presenting and doing different things all week, and I, I was so preoccupied with that. I, was just, I just kept reminding myself, I was like, Lord, because I was spending time praying and meditating in the Word, but I was like, Lord, you gotta bring this together. And you know, the thing is, is that the Lord honors your faith. Right? When you come on a Friday night when it's rainy and gross out and you show up and you put your butt in that seat and you set your heart to attention, the Lord will honor your faith. Mm -hmm. And I truly believe that he has a way to help us receive exactly what we have or exactly what we need. And so the topic tonight is receiving restoration. Um, you know, so you may think of that topic and think, I don't know that I need restoration. Um, but I believe that tonight's message is going to be for everyone. So whether you need physical healing or strength or whatever that may look like for you, just reach out and grab it because the Lord wants it for you. As I was praying for you guys this week, you know, his love is just so powerful. Do you guys believe that? He loves you so much. I'm beginning to realize that truly everything starts and ends with the love of God, right? Isn't yes. that what it says in 1 Corinthians? That basically if you have, don't have love, you have nothing, Amen. right? And if you don't know that, if you don't know that God loves you, I'm going to tell you I'm going to start with that. God 
who loves you. He doesn't just tolerate you. He doesn't just put up with you. He is absolutely head over heels in love with you. And whatever has gone on this week that has <laughs> occupied your mind or this month or this year or 2020, Lord Jesus, help us. Yes. The love of God will take care of every situation in your life, yes. every single one. So we're going to talk tonight about um, believing and receiving the impossible. And we're going to start in, uh, let's see, we're going to start in Mark 10, 27. And I was reading this a couple of weeks ago, and I just kind of stumbled across this verse. And you know how sometimes you'll, like, you'll, you'll find a verse and the Holy Spirit just puts his finger on it? And all of a sudden, you're like, whoa, wait a minute, I need to stop here. He says, but Jesus looked. He looked at his disciples. He's talking to them. He's actually talking to them about finances. He's talking to them about money, right? But he's talking about something that is a seemingly impossible situation. So it says, but Jesus looked at them and said, with men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God, all things are possible. And it struck me in this verse that he actually acknowledges that there are two roads that you can, you can drive down. As a Christian, non-Christian, whatever, there are two roads. There, there's the possible, possible, spirit realm, the realm where God lives, and there's the impossible. Now, sometimes Christians will, say, will almost deny that, they'll almost deny that the impossible realm exists, but it does exist. Impossible is a very real reality in the natural world, right? But impossible, that word impossible, it's not found in heaven. It's not a word that originated in heaven. It's not a word that originated with God. It doesn't exist in his vocabulary. Impossible is a word that is bound entirely to this natural worldly realm, realm and it has no place or standing in the spiritual world where God resides. It has no standing. You're not going to get to heaven and hear that word. Think about it, right? It's a word that simply just doesn't exist, but it's a world that the entire society, the entire world, this is a stream, this current that everybody is living in. And unfortunately, a lot of Christians are living here too. They're living here. I know, he agrees. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. But see, it's not for us. It's not for us. And the thing is, is we're going to encounter impossible in a variety of situations and circumstances in our lives, but it's simply a matter of acknowledging, yes, with men, some things are impossible. But I am not just a man. I am with God. He lives on the inside of me. Therefore, all things are possible. That's why in Matthew 18, 18, it says, Surely I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. When you bind the possible of heaven, right? When you bind it on earth, you're, you're basically saying, I'm going to live here. I'm going to live here in the impossible. Because even though possible is in heaven, I have bound it on earth with my words, and I have received the impossible is where I have to live. And the Lord wants us to break free from this tonight because there's some things that he wants us to lay hold of, and it's going to require us getting out of the natural flesh sense realm and staying and living over here in the possible. Are you guys awake tonight? Are you sure? Does the Lord need to give more thunder? <laughs> All right, so now that you guys are so quiet, I'm going to read to you, okay? You don't even have to read yourselves. But I'm going to rapid fire some scriptures that talks about nothing being impossible. Luke 137 says, for nothing will be impossible with God. Matthew 19, 26 said, but Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. In Jeremiah 32, 17, it says, ah, Lord God, it is you who made heavens and the earth by your great power and your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. 
Mark 10, 27 said, but Jesus looked at them and said, with man it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. Luke 18, 27 said, but he said, what is impossible with men is possible with God. Philippians 4, 13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Genesis 18, 14 says, is anything too hard for the Lord? Job 42, 2 says, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Matthew 17, 20 says, for truly I say to you, if you have faith like the grain of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. What is he saying? If you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you can step from this lane of impossible over to the possible where the spirit realm is and you can have access to everything that heaven has to offer. Amen. Hallelujah, that's good. Yes. Mark eleven twenty four 24 says, therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you've received it and it will be yours. Romans eight thirty one says, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Ephesians 3.20 says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we could ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Genesis 11.6 says, And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, they have one language, and this is the only, only the beginning of what they can do, and nothing that they propose to do will be impossible for them. That means that when you are in unity, when you are in unity, you can go from the impossible to the possible. There's nothing quicker, there's nothing that will take you quicker from the possible, the realm of the spirit, into the realm of the flesh, like disunity, like division, like strife. Have you guys seen a lot of that this year? Lord, help us. We got to stay in the possible and stay in peace and stay in love and stay in unity. That's how the body of Christ is going to get things done. Hallelujah. Isaiah 59, 1 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save or his ear dull that it cannot hear. Hebrews 11, one through three says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, for by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was made out of things that are, that are the, for what was, is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Hallelujah. Jeremiah 32, 27 says, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? You know, we can read that. We can say, oh, yeah, nothing's too hard for the Lord. But then, you know, we're standing in the middle of a doctor's office, and they tell us something that we don't want to hear. Is that the scripture going through our heads? I've been there. <laughs> I've gotten that evil report. Okay, so those are just a few scriptures. That's not even taking into account the life of Jesus, right? The life of Jesus, where he went about doing good, healing all who would have faith, right? And have faith in him. He healed all of the sick. Sick. He defied the laws of the impossible by multiplying food, taking tax money out of a fish's mouth, restoring limbs. He's the God of the, he's the God of the possible, right? Because like I said, impossible is not impossible. <laughs> he doesn't know what impossible is. Hallelujah. All right, so I want to go to Luke 1, 34 through 36. Luke 1, 34 through 36. I'm going to pull up my Bible. Bible's going to behave. You guys, I got a new Bible, so the other one was like falling apart. So this one is, is much better. It is Luke 1, 34. Then Mary said to the angel, okay, so obviously context here, right? This is when the angel Gabriel shows up to Mary, and he says, Congratulations, you're about to receive the son of the most high God in your stomach, even though you've never known a man, right? Pretty, uh, pretty interesting circumstance for her. So in verse 34, Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? And the angel answered her and he said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the most high will overshadow you. Maybe I should read from up there. Therefore also the Holy One is, is it, are we in the New King James? 
The Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her, her who was called barren. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Okay, so I want to pull out two things from the scripture. For one, she's saying, this, this thing that you told me, angel of God, this is impossible in the natural realm, so how is this going to happen? What's going to take me from this lane that I live in? Because she's an unborn again woman. This is the lane she's living in. What's going to take me from this impossible realm over into the possible where I'm going to have a seed put on the inside of me that's going to conceive a son? How's this going to happen? And he's saying the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. The Holy Spirit, let me ask you, when we receive the Lord, who do we get? The Holy Spirit. So he's giving us a secret into how we live in this possible realm. We have the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. It's in the spirit that we live in this realm of possible. So he's saying, Mary, I understand that you're over here, but the Holy Spirit's going to overshadow you. The power of the Most High God is going to come upon you, and you're going to go right over here into this world of the possible. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Now, in uh, verse 36, it says, Now, indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, you know, because she, Elizabeth, the relative who was, who was barren, she got John the Baptist, said, Now, indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and now is the sixth month for her who was called barren. So I was reading this, and one of the things that stuck out to me a lot in the Bible is they would give labels to people. And I think this is something that's still happening today. This is, he's basically saying the impossible, right, was going on in Elizabeth's life. She had the label of barren. She was never going to have kids. Her relatives, her neighbors, everybody she knew saw her as Elizabeth the barren. That was her identity. Her identity was fixed in something that was not going to change. When you are barren in the natural realm, you're not having a baby. Nothing's happening there. You're barren, right? But he's saying that power, that same spirit of God took her from the impossible to the possible. And now that label of barren, who was called, she wasn't called that after that. The power of God stripped her of an identity that was never meant to be hers. It stripped her of that identity. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The world is quick to hand out labels and impossible. And honestly, sometimes I feel like, and please, please hear my heart in this, sometimes I feel like we take those labels and we wear them as a badge of honor. And th the thing is, is that I understand that sometimes when we have suffered something, it almost feels like a, a righteous cause to, to wear that label as like a, I overcame this, or I did this, or I'm going through this, and yet I'm still living my life, and I'm still inspired by those people. But friends, there is so much more. You don't simply have to be a cancer survivor. Cancer can be so eradicated from your identity that you never even realized yeah. it was there. Yes. I will tell you this, as somebody who didn't have a voice for two years, and who suffered a lot during those two years, I sometimes forget, forgive me, that that was my life because the Lord has blessed me so much. You know, I had, um, last week, <laughs> my body was attacked in the weirdest way. Um, my tongue swelled up so bad I couldn't talk. And I was like, what is going on? My husband was laughing at me because I was like, huh, huh, totally like this. But it brought me back. It brought me back to when I was silent for two years and the enemy tried to steal my voice. He tried to steal it from me. And he would love for me to go back to that place of shutting up. <laughs> it's not gonna happen. It's not gonna happen, right? But I, there were so many labels during that time that people tried to hand me. And in my heart, the Holy Spirit said, no, no. 
You will not be the quiet one. You will not be the hoarse one. You will not be the one to sit in a corner and, and stay quiet. That is not who you are. You have a strong voice in my kingdom. I had a label by medical professionals who couldn't figure out what was going on, so they just tried to give me something, and had I reached and held on to that, I would have been bound in this impossible. And so I wanna encourage you, whether you've been given a label or you're going to be given a label, it is under your feet. There is nothing, there is nothing the Lord wants for you that has sickness and disease attached to it. He's not trying to teach you something. I guarantee it. There's a lot of people that didn't learn anything when they were sick. If he was going to use a teacher, it would be something else. Right? Because like I said, you think he wants you bound in something that's not even ordained or created by him? No. No. Hallelujah. God wants us to live in the spirit. John 4.24. You guys are quiet, but I'm just going to pretend that you're sinking it all in. <laughs> That's okay. Sometimes I'm quiet, too. I know it's hard to believe. Um, all right. John 4, 24 says, God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God is a spirit. Have you ever tried to fellowship with God through your flesh? Lord, I just want to feel something. I can't feel you, Lord. Where are you, Lord? It's because he's not in your feels. <laughs> it's not where he lives. He lives in your spirit. And you better be glad he lives in your spirit because he lived, if he lived in your flesh, he wouldn't be able to get a whole lot done. He wants you over here. He is a spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. This is the lane where the Holy Spirit can communicate spirit to spirit. And it cannot be deceived. It cannot be mimicked. It cannot be interpreted any other way because it's spirit to spirit. That's why praying in the Holy Spirit is so powerful. And if you don't have that gift, I encourage you to get it. Because it's powerful. It's you communing with the Lord spirit to spirit. And the only way that you can worship in truth is if you're worshiping in spirit. Because I guarantee you there are days when your flesh and your emotions and everything on the inside of your body is not in truth. It's not in truth. <laughs> the devil plays in your flesh. And I, I mean, I'm not one to deny emotions. I think that uh, God has given us emotions for a reason. I think they're a beautiful gift, but they're not always in line with truth, and we need to be aware of that, right? Can you guys, I'm going to drink my water. Mm. Hallelujah. John 6, 63. We're going somewhere. Woo, hallelujah. <clears throat> it is the spirit who gives life, the flesh prophets, Nothing. It doesn't say the flesh profits something. It doesn't say the natural realm is really good for some things. Nope. It's the spirit. It's the possible. It's the lane of God that directs your spirit to his spirit, right? That profits something. He said, the words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. That's why it's so important that we know the word, you guys that we know the word. The thing is, we can read books by people who are godly men and women, and I believe in that, right? But if you don't know the word, you're not having life infused into your, your body, your mind, your will, your emotions, every part of your being on a daily basis. As women, we should know the word. It should be infused into the very core of our being. Right, so I think we've proven now that it is the spirit, the realm of the possible, where we want to live, where we want to be, right? Okay, so now we're going to look at, did I not print that? Oh, no. Okay, we're going there. We're going to look at Hebrews 11. I'm going to read it up there because these are the two versions I don't have. Thank you, Lord. It says, Hebrews 11, 11 says, because of faith, Sarah herself, received physical power to conceive a child, even when she was long past the age for it, because she considered God, who had given her the promise. 
to be reliable and trustworthy and true to his word. Can you guys hear me okay? This thing keeps moving. She considered him, oh, go back, sorry. She considered God who had given her the promise to be reliable and trustworthy and true to his word. When your world has been shaken, when your world is upside down, when the impossible is screaming at you, do you know the God who is reliable and trustworthy and true to his word? Do you know the word enough to trust the word? Sarah was another one that was called barren, who had a baby at 90 years old. And she considered God to be reliable and trustworthy and true to his word. I want to look at this in the Passion. Sarah's faith embraced God's miracle power to conceive, even though she was barren and was past the age of childbearing. For the authority of her faith rested in the one who made the promise, and she tapped into his faithfulness. She tapped into his faithfulness. The authority of her faith rested in the one who made the promise. You know, Sarah didn't start off that way. <laughs> if you go back and you read the story of Sarah, it was a little bit bumpy for her. She had some wild ideas. She almost messed things up. Well, she messed things up pretty bad by giving Hagar to her husband and trying to create a family that way. She didn't start 25 years when God initially gave her the promise with the right heart, with the right mind, with the right perception of God. But if you read the story, and as the years go by, Sarah learned, she judged, it says in the New King James Version that she judged him faithful who had given her the promise. So even if you haven't started off, <laughs> you know, maybe the doctor gave you the report and you accept it, or maybe somebody tried to give you the label and you accept it. Maybe, you know, things happen and you got a really rough start. That's okay. Just start now. Judge him faithful who had given the promise, and you will tap into his faithfulness. Hallelujah. All right, we're going to read Romans 4, 16 through 25 in the message. All right, so I'm going to read this kind of quick, but this is really good, you guys. So this is why the promise of God, this is why the fulfillment of God's promise depends entirely on trusting God in his way and then simply embracing him in what he does. God's promise arrives as a pure gift. That's the only way everyone can be sure to get in on it. Those who keep the religious traditions and those who have never heard of and those who have never heard of them. For Abraham is a father, the is father of us all. He is not our racial father. That's reading the story backwards. He is our faith father. We call Abraham father not because he got God's attention for living like a saint. So Abraham, we know, is Sarah's husband, right? So he got the term father. God said he was going to be the father of many nations. He got God's attention by not living like a saint, but because God made something out of Abraham when he was nobody. Isn't that what we always read in scripture? God saying to Abraham, I set you up as a father of many peoples. Abraham was first named father and then became a father because he dared to trust God to do what only God could do. Raise the dead to life with a word and make something out of nothing. Raise the dead to life with a word and make something out of nothing. Does that sound like the realm of the possible to you? That we serve a God that can literally make something out of nothing? Amen. What something do you need? What something do you need in your life right now? Are you looking at the realm of the impossible? Does the doctor say it's impossible? Does the expert say it's impossible? Does your own body say it's impossible? Do your emotions say it's impossible? God can make something out of nothing. Meditate on that. That is absolutely incredible. In Romans uh, 4.17, in the New Living Translation, sorry, go one more. Yeah, 18, or keep going. <laughs> I should have had my Bible up here. Go to 18, please. I 
think I'm in the wrong one. Forgive me. All right, let's go to Romans 4.21 in the NIV, which I don't typically use the NIV, but I really liked the way that this showed a picture of this. So we're talking about Abraham, right, and Sarah, who believed God, and so they were able to latch on to that all things were possible through him. So we're going to go in verse 21. It says that Abraham, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. Do you know what it takes to be fully persuaded on something? Do you know that belief is the highest form of identity, right? So if you believe something, whether true or false, if you believe it, it becomes your identity, right? So for Abraham to become fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised, do you ever wonder what that looked like in a practical day-to-day basis? For one, he didn't have the Holy Spirit. Right. We have the Holy Spirit. Right. He didn't have the Bible like we have it today. We have the Bible. Right. To be honest with you, I feel like the, from stepping in from the realm of the impossible over to possible is simply becoming in our heart fully persuaded on whatever it is that the Lord is speaking to us. And sometimes that fully persuaded does not happen overnight. It might take years. It might take years. But see, I want to be a woman who doesn't just believe the word. I want to be fully persuaded in my bones, right? Because it says in in Mark 11, 23, that you cannot doubt in your heart, but you have to believe those things which you say shall come to pass. Then you shall have what you say. If you are not fully persuaded on something and doubt is in your heart, you will not have what you say, and you will stay forever in this lane of impossible, and you can be in a word of faith church with amazing pastors like we have, and you will still live in this land of impossible. Yes, yes. Amen. And I think sometimes being fully persuaded is not just meditating on the word, it's allowing ourselves at a heart level to have an identity of faith, right? Because faith at its core, what is faith? Faith is the substance of things hoped for. For one, we need to make sure our hope is not turned off. You know, sometimes, you know, if a situation is bad enough, it can feel almost like a self-preservation to turn off our hope, right? It's almost like a, a protective mechanism, or I'm trying to think of a simpler way to put it. We basically say, it's like our heart says, danger, danger, danger. And the first inclination of our flesh is to shut down the hope. Well, I don't want to get disappointed. But see, faith can only be the substance of what you're hoping for. So if you have shut down your hope, you have shut down your faith, and you are staying in this realm of impossible. And the thing is, you can come to church, you can love the Lord. And that song, I almost didn't play that song There's nothing that our God can't do. Because that's true, but I will tell you this, there are some things that our God won't do. And you know what he won't do? He will not override your will. He will not make you turn your hope on. But I will tell you this, he is a safe space. The heart of God is a safe space. Go read Psalm 91. If you're ever just feeling like, you know what, I I feel scared, I feel vulnerable, right? When we're feeling vulnerable, it can feel very easy to shut our heart down and to turn hope off. Maybe somebody said something to us, maybe we were hurt, maybe we put ourselves out there and we failed. The reasons are endless, right? But I can tell you that vulnerability, it's actually a gift, You know, I've learned that too, just getting up here and preaching with you guys. You know, I don't typically share my life like I do when I get up here and I preach. And sometimes I get off the platform and I have what Brene Brown calls like a vulnerability hangover. (laughs) And I'm just like, I can't believe I shared all that. Right? Because it's personal. It's life. It's the nitty gritty. I was speaking to a group of women recently and with my job I get to I get to minister. It's really cool. I get to minister to women without them even realizing I'm ministering to them. (laughs) And they're like, Amy, you're just so inspiring and so blah, blah. And I'm like, that's God. I know it's God, right? Because they sense my spirit. They sense the love of God on the inside of me. And I'm not even allowed to openly talk about the Lord, but they don't know why they love me so much, but they love him. 
right? And I was, I was ministering in a roundabout way to this group of women. They asked me to come in and do a training for them on mindset and business. And so I'm on this Zoom call. It's late at night. And the Lord showed me exactly what to say. And, and I told them, I said, listen, I said, I'm going to share from the heart. I said, because at the end of the day, you guys, if we as women cannot come together and share from the heart, right, and be ourselves and, and, and love each other and uplift each other and inspire each other, then what are we doing, right? It's so important as women that we stay soft, that we stay vulnerable. And that doesn't mean that we don't, um, that we put ourselves in compromising situations. That's not what I'm saying. And obviously, you have to trust people, right? You want to be discerning and wise where that's concerned. But at the same time, too, just make sure that we're keeping our hearts soft. Because the Lord can't get in there when our hearts are hard. Right. And if we want to receive the possible, then we need to have a soft heart, right, that is fueled by hope so that our faith can be in operation. And, it, and like that verse said that I read earlier in Mark 11, 23, if you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, Rose did a teaching years ago on the mustard seed. We're talking a tiny bit of faith. God can move mountains through you. He can take you so far over into the realm of possible that you won't know what hits you from a mustard seed. That's it. That's all you need. So for those of you who are thinking, that sounds hard. It's not hard. It's not hard, but it will take maybe some practice. I know for me it's practice because I can be blah, 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 always on the go, and I you know, have a very demanding schedule at the current moment, right? But I've been practicing at night, laying in my bed, being super quiet, and just saying, Lord, help me see what you see. Help me see it at a heart level, right? Because we receive... The possible, the impossible is made possible at a heart level. Jesus always dealt with the heart. He never dealt with the outward man. He always said, you know, out of, out of the heart a man speaks, right? As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So at a heart level, we need to see ourselves receiving the impossible. There are two things that I basically have been told right now that are impossible. But see, I know that at a heart level, Right? I, I, can, I can step over here into my heart. This is my natural flesh. This is what the doctors see. They see this, so they're saying, based on this, this is impossible. And I say, I understand that's what you're looking at, but I'm looking at this. So based on this, at a heart level, this is possible. And this is where I'm living, right here. And I guarantee every single day my body is going, eh, come over here, come over here. You have this title, you have this title. What about this, what about this? Nope, I'm living over here. This is where we receive. Receiving restoration, this is where we receive, right here at this heart level. I was listening to a story recently. Andrew Womack was telling it, but it was actually about another faith minister. It was about a pastor's wife who was blind she was really discouraged because she had been prayed for multiple times and she had never received her healing. And this healing minister came into town and he was ministering at their church. And, um, and he kind of cornered her <laughs> and was like, do you want your sight? You know, he kind of provoked her faith a little bit. And so, oh, is somebody trying to come in? He provoked her faith a little bit. So he sat her down and he said, close your eyes and I'm going to pray for you. And he said, so he prays for her and then he asks her, now can you see? So she opens her eyes and he said, I didn't tell you to open your eyes. And she gets confused. So she closes her eyes again and he goes, now tell me, can you see? So she opens her eyes again. He's like, I didn't tell you to open your eyes. So this woman's confused, right? As would most of us be. So she closes her eyes again. He says, can you see? He said, I need you to see it in your heart. 
before you can receive it. So she sat there and she prayed in the spirit for a few minutes and she got quiet and she said, I can see it. I can see it. She opened her eyes and she could see. Why? Because we live from the inside out. We spend so much time, so much attention, so much adornment on the outside. So much focus. And all we're really saying is, I want to live in the realm of the world. I want to be confined to this world. Isn't that what Romans talking about? Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Come over here. Be, tr- be transformed. I was talking to a friend of mine recently. I'm really proud of her. She's made a lot of changes in the last few months. And she said, Amy, it's the most incredible thing because when I started this journey, I thought it was going to be all about the natural. She said, what I'm really realizing is it's all about my inner life, and I'm changing because I'm transforming in the inside, and her body is lining up. Yes. We have it backwards so many times, yes. and yes. it's a frustrating place to be in. Yes. So I would encourage you, go back to the spirit. Go back to the spirit. Worship the Lord, right? Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Get quiet and see it on the inside. And you shall have it. Your hope will be fueled and your faith will be fueled. And you'll live in the realm of the possible. Hallelujah. I want to talk about restoration here for just a quick minute. The... the, a definition of restore is to return a person as a spe- to return to a person a specific thing which he has lost or which has been taken from him and unjustly detained. The enemy has stolen from some of you. And so the Lord wants me to encourage you and build up your faith here in the next few minutes. I don't care what it is. I don't care what it is. It says in uh, Proverbs that if the thief is caught, he has to restore sevenfold what he has stolen. I realized a few years ago that the thief had stolen from me several things, and he has to repay seven times what he stole. Because when God restores you, he doesn't just give you enough to get by. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. So we're going to look in Matthew 12, 9 through 13. Thank you, Lord. So this is for somebody. I don't know who it's for, but I just encourage you to reach out and receive it. Thank you, Lord. Now, when he had departed from there, he went into their synagogue. This is speaking of Jesus. And behold, there was a man who had a withered hand. And they asked him, saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath that they might accuse him? Then he said to them, What man is there among you that has one sheep, and if it falls into a pit in the Sabbath, will you not lay hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value, then, is this man than a sheep? Therefore, to the man, he said, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and it was restored, and as whole as the other. Okay, so he, basically, there's a man with a withered hand. I actually know someone who has a withered hand. Have you ever thought about this? Because you probably have all read the scripture at one point. He says to a man with a withered hand, stretch out your hand. This man with a withered hand is living in the lane of the impossible. It's impossible for someone with a withered hand to stretch out their hand. But at the word of God, hope. Remember that hope we were talking about? He said, stretch out your hand, and there was enough faith and enough hope in just those words that that man latched onto what he said, and he went from the impossible to the possible instantaneously. Instantaneously. What if that man had reasoned out, stretch out your hand? We're going to look at somebody who was almost snared by that very thing. We're going to look at 2 Kings 5.5. The king of Aram had great admiration for Naaman, the commander of his army, because through him the Lord had given Aram great victories. But though Naaman was a mighty warrior, okay, so Naaman is the warrior, he suffered from leprosy. At this time, Armenian raiders invaded the land of Israel, and among their captives was a young girl. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought it was up there. Second Kings, we're starting in room five. 
Forgive me, you guys. I'm going too fast. Where are you at? Cal five. Okay. Um, let me make sure I'm in the right spot. So the kings of Syria said, go now and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. Oh no, you skipped some, Cal, I'm sorry. Go back to verse two. We gotta get the context. So at this time, Armenian raiders had invaded the land of Israel. Where are you at? We're in 2 Kings 5. <laughs> we got to get Cal some coffee. I'm teasing, I'm teasing. 2 Kings 5, 2. Okay, so we're talking about the healing of Naaman, right? Naaman the leper. There's that label again. Woo! At this time, Armenian raiders had invaded the land of Israel. Among their captives was a young girl who had been given to Naaman's wife as her maid. So one day the girl said to her mistress, I wish my master would go see the prophet in Samaria. He would heal him of his leprosy. So Naaman told the king what the young girl from Israel had said. Go and visit the prophet, the king of Aram told him. I will send a letter of introduction for you to take to the king of Israel. So Naaman started out carrying his gift his gift, 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. The letter to the king of Israel said, With this letter I present you my servant Naaman. I want you to heal him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes in dismay and said, This man sends me a leper to heal? Am I God that I can give life and take it away? I can see that he's just trying to pick a fight with me. Because he's basically saying, Hey, I heard that... In your land, people heal, so I'm sending you a bunch of money, heal him. But the king is not the prophet, right? So he's basically like, you're handing me this impossible case, so clearly you're picking a fight with me. He's clearly living in this land of the impossible. But when Elijah, the man of God, who lives in the land of possible, heard the king of Israel had torn his clothes in dismay, he sent this message to him and he said, why are you so upset? Send Naaman to me, and he will learn that there's a true prophet here in Israel. I love the boldness of Elijah there. Shouldn't we all be that bold? Somebody who you know is sick, who the doctors have turned away, send them to me. I have the power of God on the inside of me. I'll take care of it. Thank you, Lord. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and waited at the door of Elijah's house. But Elijah sent a messenger out to him with this message. Go and wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River. Then your skin will be restored and you will be healed of your leprosy. But Naaman became angry and he stalked away. I thought he would certainly come out to meet me, he said. I expected him to wave his hand over my leprosy and call on the name of the Lord his God to heal me. Aren't the rivers of Damascus, the Abana, and the Farpar better than all the rivers of Israel? Why shouldn't I wash in them and be healed? So Naaman turned away and went in rage. So... He's basically showed up. He's, he's had a long journey. This has been a long process for him. He has in his mind how this is going to go. He has in his mind how he's going to receive restoration. He has in his mind how he's going to go from the impossible to the possible, and it didn't involve the Jordan. It didn't involve going to take a shower, right? He's basically saying, hey, um, I have what's equivalent to the Mayo Clinic in my town, and you want to send me to the CVS Minute Clinic? And this is not going to work for me, right? So he, he almost lost out, but thank God for friends. This is why you need to hang around godly people. But his officers tried to reason with him and said, Sir, if the prophet had told you to do something very difficult, wouldn't you have done it? So you should certainly obey him when he simply says, Go and wash and be cured. Sometimes our obedience are those tiny, minuscule steps that we despise, that we question, that we think couldn't possibly be God because they're not showy or flashy enough, and we miss out. That's why we need to have godly men and women in our life or godly pastors. That's why I'm grateful for this church. Thank you, Lord. 
So Naaman listened to his uh, friends. Thank God. He went down to the Jordan River. He dipped himself seven times as the man of God and instructed him. And his skin became as healthy as the skin of a young child's. And he was healed. So God did not just restore him. He gave him skin as a young child. He didn't just give him his former state back. He gave him better. Remember what I said that if the enemy steals from you, he has to return sevenfold? That sevenfold showed up in an unborn again, unsanctified man who did not have a covenant. How much more? How much more? You, as a child of God, have access to complete and total restoration, whatever that looks like for you. Thank you, Lord. Naaman almost lost out because he expected it to be a hard leap from the impossible to the, impos- to the possible. But his obedience is what caused him to lay out and finally receive. So I would encourage you, obedience is important. Obedience is important. Thank you, Lord. Uh, we're going to close with Ephesians 119 in the New Living Translation. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. That's Philippians. That's not what I want. Sorry, guys. Give me one second. Nope. Is it up there? Okay, I'll just read it from there. I pray also that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the right hand, a place of honor, at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. So I want you to think about this for a minute. Okay, what is the ultimate picture of restoration? Jesus. Jesus is the ultimate picture of restoration. The way that he died, nobody is coming back from that, right? He was so brutally deformed that he did not even have the likeness of a man. And he went to hell on our behalf, and he was raised three days later, and I guarantee he did not come out of that grave looking like he'd been sick, looking like he'd been hurt, looking bruised and beat up and yucky. He is the ultimate picture of restoration. And what are they trying to say in this verse? He's saying, God, show them that the same mighty power that was restoring Jesus from the dead lives in them. That power is working in them. That power is ever moving on their behalf. That power is taking them each and every single day and they will choose to walk and step out of that natural. It's going to take them to the land of the possible through the word of God, through the spirit of God, through the power of God. And that's the covenant you have. That's the power that you have access to. So I hope this is encouraging to you tonight. Praise God. You know, I have to be obedient. I'm sorry. (laughs) The The Lord impressed on me to pray for you. If there is something that you are currently facing that in the natural is impossible, I would like to pray for you. Um, And I'm going to be in agreement with you that that you're going to be set free. Whatever that situation is, it's going to be restored. It's going to be perfected. It's going to be completely taken care of. I don't know if that's one of you. I don't know if that's all of you. But I just tried to get off the stage, and the Lord won't let me. So I'm going to pray for whoever wants to. And if you have to go, totally understand. Um, Is that okay, Rose? Okay. Okay.